All right. Yeah, so um, I'm going to give you a brief tour of scikit-learn today. Be um, before I'm going to do that, just a little bit about myself. So I did my PhD in, uh, in computer science. I actually have a PhD in computer science without taking any classes. Uh, at a uh, university in Bonn, I did a brief stint as uh, machine learning at Amazon in uh, Berlin, went to the NYU Center for Data Science, and I'm now a um, lecturer at the Columbia University in the Data Science Institute. So um, what is scikit-learn? So scikit-learn is a Python library, and it's a Python library for machine learning. And um, I want to talk today a little about um, how this might be different from what you're used to and sort of how machine learning is viewed in scikit-learn and what are the main paradigms. Um, so scikit-learn has a lot of stuff in it. It has a bunch of algorithms. So actually, like everything you find in a standard um, machine learning textbook will be implemented there, like classification, regression, uh, k-means, clustering, dbscan, whatever, uh, tSNE. Uh, and all, there's all of these algorithms together with tools to evaluate these algorithms and um, tools to tune hyperparameter, do cross-validation, and these things. Um, it's been pretty successful. Like, here's some logos of companies that worked with it. Um, but actually, I think most companies now that do machine learning somewhere use it in some place. So it's heavily used in industry and also um, like a bunch of research. So we nearly have 10,000 research, uh, 10,000 uh, citations on the paper, which would really makes me want to be on the paper, which I'm not. So, um, so scikit-learn is a really big community effort. So this are like, these are the core developers. I think there's about 40. Um, there's about 50 people contributing every month. So um, I'm not the person who created it. That are some people in the top row. Um, but uh, I've been like one of the core developers for the last seven years or something like that. Um, so what we're really proud of in, with scikit-learn is in particular our documentation, which uh, you should definitely check out. Some people said, oh, you don't need to read a machine learning book. You can uh, just read the documentation. I don't entirely agree with this, but I think uh, we did a pretty good job. In particular, we have like a whole bunch of examples so you can go through and look at the gallery and see how everything works. And I think that's uh, pretty good. But so I want to talk to you about how this actually uh, works and how you can use it in practice. So first, basic API. So scikit-learn works on NumPy arrays. So NumPy arrays are homogeneous arrays. So that means they have one data type. So they're quite different from data frames. And so we assume that our input data is some float matrix X, um, where like each row corresponds to one sample, and each column corresponds to one feature or uh, one independent variable. And so this would be our input, and we have a separate array if we do classification or regression, that is, uh, would be outputs or labels. So we have two different objects, one for data, one for the targets. And um, so we, we, most of the algorithms in scikit-learn assume that everything is a float. So by default, none of these work with categorical data or uh, missing values. This is something you have to take care of yourself. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later. But this is sort of the basic paradigm and we always call the data X and the labels Y. All right, so here's how I think about machine learning uh, pipeline, in particular supervised machine learning, which is sort of the most common used form. So you start with this training data and you're training labels and you build a model which could be like linear regression, random forest, gradient boosting, whatever. And uh, you have some new data for which you don't have labels, usually um, for which you can want to make predictions. Often you want to evaluate how good your model is, so actually you have holdout test data with test labels, which allows you to say, okay, my uh, model generalizes uh, this, this well. So for me, machine learning means that I'm mostly interested in how well my model generalizes. I'm uh, like, I know here people that maybe have more of a statistics background where you're more interested in understanding the model. Uh, Scikit-learn is really tuned towards making predictions and making accurate predictions. So um, I don't think there's, none of the values have, uh, none of the models have any p-values associated with them in Scikit-learn. So if you're looking for that, this is not the right thing. If you want to make accurate predictions, uh, then Scikit-learn will be helpful. All right, so this is sort of the standard workflow in supervised machine learning, and this is, um, there's basically two phases. You train a model, you train data, and then you want to generalize to new data. And this is uh, mirrored very directly in the scikit-learn API. 
So all the algorithms in scikit-learn are implemented as Python classes. So let's say I want a random forest classifier. There's a Python class that's called uh, random forest classifier to train random forests for classification. These objects um, contain both the algorithms, or they encapsulate the algorithms for building the models and for making predictions. They will also store all the model parameters. So here, for example, in the random forest classifier, um, if I call fit, fit will build the model. And this will store all the trees, all the splits of the trees, and so on in this CLF object. Uh, all uh, models in scikit-learn have a fit function, and it always looks exactly the same way. It always gets the training data, which I call x-train. And if it's a supervised algorithm like here, it gets also the desired outputs uh, y-train. So this fit function uh, stores the model in, CL uh, in CLF. So this is sort of all you have to do to build a random forest. If you want to apply this to new data, there's clf.predict, which uh, you input only uh, any new data that you have, or you could also do the training data, and it will return the predictions according to the model. There's also a score function, which is basically just a helper function that does both the prediction and then evaluates against some known ground truth. So clf.score makes predictions on x test according to the model, and then you compare it to y test, and then it reports accuracy. So this is sort of the most common interface for scikit-learn, and like all the models for classification and regression will follow exactly this interface, and you mostly need to think about uh, fit and predict. These are sort of the core methods. There's another interface in scikit-learn that's also very important, um, in particular in unsupervised learning and in preprocessing. So this is for unsupervised learning and or preprocessing, where someone gives you uh, a training data set, and say you want to do PCA. So you have your training data. There's no labels or ground truths or something like this. You just have your matrix X, and you build a model from this. Then when um, you, you get some new data or you have your test data, you want to apply this model, and this model will give you a new view of your data. So uh, let's say a projection onto the principal components or something like that. This is sort of um, a slightly uh, different task and has a slightly different interface. So the way this works in scikit-learn is, again, everything is encapsulated as an object. So if I have PCA, I want to do PCA, I instantiate a PCA object. I call fit. Again, all things in scikit-learn have a fit method. And so here, I just give it the training data x um, because it's an unsupervised method. And then if I want to. Um, actually project to the principal components, I use the transfer method on any data. This will give me my new view, my new representation of the data x new. So um, these are basically the, the three main functions you need to understand for scikit-learn. So we call our models estimators. So estimators could be anything, um, like a random forest or scaling your data or something like this all have a fit uh, method. They always take the data x. If it's a supervised method, it also takes uh, some target output y. If you predict something that is like a labeling, so for classification, regression, and clustering, you use the predict method to uh, make this prediction. And if you want to get a new view of the data, a new representation, a new x, you use the transfer method which is uh, used for preprocessing, dimensionality reduction, uh, feature selection, and feature extraction. So these are sort of the two main building blocks are things to transform your data and things to make predictions. But we also have more building blocks for sort of standard machine learning tasks, particularly for model evaluation and selection. So um, there's tools to do a uh, train test split, which is like very simple. I'm not actually going to talk about this, but often instead of doing a uh, train test split, you want to use cross validation. Um, I think you're all familiar with cross validation, so maybe I can skip this, where you split your data, say, in five folds, and um, you hold out one fold and train on the other ones. And this gives you a more robust estimate of the generalization performance of your model. If you want to do that, um, there's a method called uh, cross val score in scikit learn. And um, cross-valve score, sorry, not method of function, um, cross-valve score gets uh, an object, data, and labels. 
and you tell it how much cross-validation you want to do. By default, it does uh, uh, three-fold certified cross-validation. Here I say oh, I want to do five-fold uh, certified cross-validation. And so um, this will return the uh, scores on the test set or on the holdout set for each of the iterations. So here I get five scores um, for the five splits of the data. And then I can compute the mean and standard deviation or something like that. So this is some, like, one of the um, very uh, commonly used tools. Another tool that's probably used even more uh, commonly is to do um, grid search to adjust parameters because all models have parameters and you always need to tune them and it's always a bit of a pain. And so the workflow that I usually encourage people to use um, might not be the one that you use, but that one that I favor is you take your data, you do a training and a test split, uh, then you do cross-validation on a training data set to tune parameters, and then you do a final evaluation on your test data. Uh, this way you have an unbiased estimate of the generalization performance by uh, running your tuned model on a test set. If you just did cross-validation to tune your parameters, then um, the estimate of generalization performance that you would have is too optimistic. So in this workflow, which is, I think, sort of the standard supervised learning workflow for me, it's pretty easy to implement with scikit-learn. The main class here that uh, you need is uh, grid search CV. So grid search CV implements grid search with cross-validation. So if I want to run this whole process, uh, I first split my training data uh, or my data into a training test with the train test split method. Then um, I need to define the parameters I want to search over. So here, SVC is a support vector machine. Uh, by default, it uses the RBF kernel. There's two parameters associated with this uh, regularization parameter C and kernel bandwidth gamma. And so now I specify a grid, what values of uh, C and gamma do I want to try out? And um, so here, I basically give an exponential range from like uh, 10 to the minus 3 till 10 to the 2 um, for both C and gamma. So this defines my search space that I want to adjust the parameters over. Uh, then to actually do the search, I um, instantiate an object, uh, a new object with this grid search CV. And um, it gets the model I want to tune and the parameter grid. I can also specify which metric to use, like if I want to use AOC or accuracy or uh, average precision, whatever you want, and how I want to do cross-validation. The cool thing here is that this grid search CV object returns this grid object, and this grid object just behaves like all of the other models. So this thing that does uh, grid search for us still has like fit predict score with exactly the same interface as uh, everything else. Only if you call fit now, what it will do is it will run cross-validation, find the best parameter models according to cross-validation score, according to the metric I give it, and then uh, use this best model and retrain this model on the whole training set. So after I did this gr uh, grid search, it retrains the model with the best parameters. And so this allows me then to make predictions. So here you see, again, this is very geared towards making predictions. It's very easy to search parameters and then make predictions with this model on new data. So this is sort of uh, pretty convenient, um, I think. So one thing I mentioned is that scikit-learn doesn't really automatically do any pre-processing. And so one of the reasons to do this is because you want to really have control over what is happening. Like, how do you want to encode your variables? How do you want to um, impute data and so on? And so more often than not, instead of taking your training data and your training labels and build a model, there's uh, a lot of things happening in between, like extracting features from text data or um, images or whatever you have, rescaling your data in the way that you think makes sense for your data set, possibly doing automated feature selection, and so on. And then this all goes into a model. A very common mistake that people then make is, OK, then I'm going to do cross-validation on the model, tune the parameters of the model, and uh, this gives, tells me how good my model will be. However, if you do this, then um, you're going to actually uh, leak a lot of information in your previous steps uh, for the cross-validation. What you really need to do is make cross-validation the outermost loop and uh, cross-validate your whole processing pipeline from feature extraction, scaling, feature uh, selection, all the transformation you uh, want to do. 
and then do cross validation over this, select the best model, select the best parameters, and then re rebuild your model. To make this very simple, uh, scikit-learn has a thing called pipelines. So pipelines are a way to um, chain together transformations. I call them here T1 and T2. Think about like imputation and uh, PCA or scaling and uh, PCA or whatever you want and the classifier. And so similar to cross validation, uh, to grid search CV, making a pipeline returns a new object that is again an estimator, has again exactly the same interface as any of the other models. So this pipe object just looks like a model again. Only now it's a chain of, let's say, two transformations and a classifier. So, and then if I call uh, fit on this model, it'll uh, fit the first transformation, uh, transform using the first transformation, fit the second transformation, transform using the second transformation, then pass the transform data onto the classifier. If I make prediction, um, prediction on new data, it'll do exactly the same transformations. It will not refit the transformations, but it'll just transform the data um, and make sure basically the test data gets exactly the same treatment as the training data. Encapsulating your whole processing pipeline like this makes it much more um, unlikely that you're leaking information or that you're doing, leaking information from your test set or that um, you're doing different steps on training and test set because you have encapsulated everything in a coherent unit. Another cool thing about using pipelines is, well, it saves code and um, also now you can do cross-validation the way you would want to do it. So for example, if I want to scale my data, so the SVM in scikit-learn does no scaling. I think by default in uh, R, the libSVM wrapper does like zero mean unit variance. Um, in scikit-learn, sort of, uh, it doesn't do that, so you have to do it yourself. And or you could say, well, it allows me to choose uh, more precisely how I want to uh, preprocess my data. OK, so I can make this pipeline here. This uh, would be scale the data and then fit the SVM. So if I want to do grid search over this, I can just um, uh, use this pipeline inside um, the grid search CV. The only thing I need to adjust is I need to tell grid search CV, which does the parameter search, which steps inside the pipeline I need to uh, want to tune the parameter on. And so here I, there's this uh, notation with a double underscore, which basically says, on the step that's called SVC, tune a parameter C. On the step that's called uh, SVC, tune a parameter gamma. And so this allows you to uh, do crit search and cross-validation over these complex pipelines. And uh, the cool thing about this is that you can not only, say, do scaling and then uh, grid search the um, parameters of the model, but uh, you can grid search parameters of everything jointly. Usually pre-processing methods like feature selection also have um, parameters. So for example, here I do feature selection uh, asking if I should use one, two, three, or four features. And so I can select over how many features should I, sel uh, should I select and the parameters C and gamma of the support vector machine together in this pipeline. So it says, uh, here I have this pipeline, select k best, is select the k best feature according um, to p values, the uh, support vector machine, and now grid search, the best value for k and select k best, and uh, the best value for c and gamma in the support vector machine. And so uh, this allows me to uh, search all these things jointly, and they're all um, encapsulated in this single grid object. All right. I think that's all I had today. So I know that was really fast, but I got 20 minutes, and so now you have all of Second Learn, nearly. Um, yeah, I have this book which you already saw, and you can follow me on Twitter or something like that.